Hello, and welcome to Virtual Investor Conferences. My name is Matt Lateplo, and on behalf of OTC Markets, we're very pleased you have joined us for our next live presentation from Desert Mountain Energy Corp. Before I introduce our speaker, a few points to note. Please submit your questions in the question box to the left of the slides. If you are interested in scheduling a meeting with Desert Mountain Energy, please click on the Meetings tab found on the left navigation bar. You will be able to view the company's availability and submit a meeting request. On a final note, all today's presentations will be recorded and available for 24-7 replay. At this point, I'm very pleased to welcome Don Mosher, President and Director of Desert Mountain Energy Corp, which trades on the OTCQX best market under the symbol DMEHF and on the TSXV under the symbol DME. Welcome, Don. Thank you very much. Uh, my pleasure to be here and the company uh, is very grateful for the opportunity. Uh, Desert Mountain Energy is a vertically integrated primary producer of helium. We've spent about two and a half years basically taking the company from grassroots exploration, having drilled our first two holes in July of 2020. The company went through a management change in the August of 2020. Uh, we did our first substantial fundraise in August of 2020. Uh, Prior to the fundraise that we did, it was a 160 unit with a $2 warrant for 13 million Canadian. Prior to that, it was all small million, million and a half dollar raises at prices around 20 to 30 cents. Um, just one sec here. Uh, the normal forward looking statements. We are really focused on the northeastern corner of Arizona currently. Uh, it's an area called the Holbrook Basin. It's very difficult drilling. We drill with air and water and it's a salt basin. Uh, Arizona itself is not an oil and gas state. Uh, in total, in the history of the state, they've only ever seen 2,500 oil or gas wells drilled, ignoring water wells, obviously. Uh, you get into a state like Oklahoma, you'll see 400,000 wells drilled in one area in Oklahoma. So for us, basically everything we drill is a wildcat. Um, our geological model is based on an old producer called Pindadome that was uh, in production from the early 60s to the mid 70s. It had some of the highest helium grades ever discovered anywhere in the world, 6 to 12 percent. The helium there was used for the Apollo program. And it didn't shut down because of the decline in the wells. It shut down because helium was selling for $6.50 an MCF back then. And the natural gas line that powered their processing facility, uh, the contract ran out on the gas and all of a sudden the economics no longer made any sense. Um, right now we are uh, in the midst of raising uh, $20 million through a short form prospectus. And we have over 100,000 acres in the Holbrook Basin, but we are, we just announced a deal here, I don't know, three or four weeks ago with a company called Petrosun, which is gonna give us access to take a look at all the technical data on another 250,000 acres in northeastern Arizona and Utah. And uh, we're looking to go to work with Petrosun. Uh, we have the processing facilities. So if they drill holes or successfully drill wells, we'll be processing the raw helium for them, paying them uh, a percentage on the raw helium. We'll process it all the way up to whatever grades we sell to end users and make our margins there. The Processing facility costs us a little north of 12 million US. It's going to be solar powered. We've got eight acres of solar panels there. I'll show you some pictures of this. It is now operational. So we are about to go into production here shortly. Uh, this year, we're looking at starting to pre-order components for two more facilities. Uh, one of those facilities will go into the Rolfing field. Uh, it was where we drilled our first two holes and the grades there were excellent. They were plus four and plus seven percent, but they also have a, quite a few noble gases in the back, argon, krypton, xeon, and neon, and they require 
some modifications to the current Macaulay helium processing facility, which has really uh, been engineered to deal with um, quite simple raw gas compositions, I guess is the best way to put it. Robert Rolfing and myself basically took over control of the company in August of 2020. There was a number of board changes at the time. Rob, prior to that, had been VP of Exploration. Um, he replaced the former CEO. So now Rob's the executive chairman and the CEO. I've taken on the role of the president. Uh, Rob has always built been involved in private business. This is really his first foray into the public markets. So he brought me along to really deal with the capital markets. Um, year 2021, we only drilled one helium well and it was successful and it identified the Macaulay helium field. But we really spent that year building a team around Rob because prior to bringing on Jessica Davies and Marta, Eric, James, Rob was doing all those jobs. He was maintaining all our land. He was acquiring new land. He was literally sitting on the drill rigs and instructing the drill crews. He did all our geology. He was a one-man band. So now we've built really a world-class team around Rob and it's extended our bandwidth, obviously. Um, <clears throat> On our board, uh, we are looking to make some changes here at the upcoming AGM. Uh, we believe that we need more independence. We do have an ambition to uplist to a, a US exchange, whether it's New York, Amex, whatever, uh, once we've qualified for it. And in regards to that, we've identified, we need more independence on this board. Rob, myself, and Jessica are definite members of management. James Cronobel is a professor at the University of Oklahoma. He acts as a consultant on the geology side. Dr. Kelly Ward is an independent. And Jenea Rolfing is fully independent. She's a VP for ConocoPhillips, but she's related to Rob. She's Rob's daughter. She is a great board member to have um, on the team. She runs all the drilling in the Permian Basin for ConocoPhillips. And Weldon Stout is a former judge in Oklahoma. Again, he's fully independent. And um, he's nice to have there for some of the legal opinions that you need once in a while. The stock, as you can see, has been very volatile. When we took over this company, there were 55 million shares issued and outstanding. And they had all been issued under 35 cents Canadian. Fortunately for us, in August of 2020, when we sampled wells one and two, and the helium percentages came in at over 7% in the first well and over 4% in the second well, the stock rocketed up to uh, $1.90 from 65 cents. And that allowed us to raise 13 million Canadian on a 160 unit with a two-year $2 warrant that we put a 350 force on. And in March of 2021, we forced the warrant and that financing turned into $29.3 million, which we managed to live off of all the way through until September of 2022, when we raised an additional $5.7 million at 260 with a 350 warrant. So with that money, we drilled eight wells, five were wildcats, three were development wells. We discovered four helium fields. We built the processing facility. We have no debt. And the money that we're looking to raise right now is all capital expenditure purposes. Um, because we did have a very strong treasury, it has allowed Rob to beat the inflation and supply chain bottleneck issues that have um, really surfaced a lot due to COVID. But trucking costs, for example, on well number one for us, when we moved the rig onto the, the well site, it was a $25,400 move. And by June of 2021, when we went to drill well number four, 
the trucking costs to move the rig had inflated to $173,000. So in March of 2022, we bought a truck fleet and all in with insurance and permits and five heavy haul tractors and three 16 or 13 axle low boys, we, uh, we purchased a fleet for $900,000. That has given us access to trucking as we need it. When we drilled well number eight, it was, it was hard to get diesel in Arizona. We trucked diesel down from Oklahoma and we saved $28,000 on a truckload of diesel, for example. So those trucks are now <clears throat> contracted out more than 24 months when we're not using them and they actually pay our GNA. They're pulling in about $200,000 a month. We've now taken delivery of the plant. It is now operational and it's about to go into this 90 day optimization program. Uh, we have had weather issues in Northeastern Arizona. When I was there three weeks ago, I was stranded on I-40 for five hours because they shut down I-40 uh, both directions due to weather conditions. The week after that, there were 147 semis in the ditch due to weather conditions. So it's caused us a couple of weeks of delays here, but I think we'll catch up. Um, we have had a rig out on well number three. Well number three ended up having some legal issues with the city of Flagstaff, which we successfully challenged and won in the courts. And we have not sampled that well yet. It was drilled in December of 2020 and it's been sitting out in the desert ever since. So we, we are looking forward to getting some sample numbers off of that shortly. Um, we are planning on starting a geophysical program looking at hydrogen in our helium fields. When we drill the four wells in the Macaulay helium field, as we drill to depth, we only drill to about 4,300 feet. They're simple vertical wells. We're almost drilling into what you you'd visualize as high grade helium pods. But at about a thousand feet in depth, we encountered sulfur free hydrogen. So we have um, signed a joint operating agreement with a company called Beam Earth out of France. They're a private company. They specialize in commercializing hydrogen. And what they're looking at doing with our hydrogen is uh, creating ammonia. We're in nitrogen fields with our helium. Our, our fields are basically 95% nitrogen, grades of three to 7% helium, uh, trace amounts of CO2. That's really all we're having to deal with here. Most helium comes out of natural gas fields. And um, with those, you need the pipelines, you need the collection facilities, you need all the infrastructure. With what we're in, because they're more or less these high-grade pods, we can run uh, lines from our wells within two or three miles to the processing facility. They're not like big pipelines for gas where you're dealing with 30, 40 million cubic feet of gas a day. With us, we're dealing with something smaller. And our flow lines from wells four, five, six, and seven are hooked directly into the Macaulay processing facility. We will be hauling gas up from well number two, which is about 30 miles away, and well number eight, which is about 11 miles away via truck and tanker and processing it there. Uh, we hope to be drilling three hydrogen wells the first of June in uh, in cooperation with Beam Earth, and then we'll be taking a look at commercializing it. Once we're done that program, we'll be moving into more wildcat helium wells. Uh, we've got other areas that we want to drill. By October, we'll have completed and tested those wells. We'll know what the gas composition is and whether they can be used, uh, whether we can use the Macaulay processing facility to process that gas, or whether it's going to be more complex and is going to go into the Rolfing field, which is the plant we're looking to take delivery on in December of this year. This is what our processing facility looks like. Um, unlike most processing facilities out there, which are put into buildings the size of football fields, this one has been assembled in five 40-foot C cans in Houston, Texas by Genron. 
All the components are built into the C-cans. They're loaded on 18 wheelers, taken off the trucks at the site with cranes, all the external piping and everything hooked in. There's eight acres of solar panels here that we plan on powering the plant up with. Initially, it's gonna be powered with compressed natural gas, but once we get the batteries in there, we'll start to run it off of solar. We're at 5,300 feet in the desert, above sea level in the desert, lots of radiant uh, temperature, there are lots of radiant sunlight, and we're 18 miles off the power grid and we're not in a natural gas field. So the logical alternative to trying to get to the power grid where you're gonna get fluctuations in your energy costs, and as opposed to helium processing facilities and natural gas fields, this was the ideal answer for us. We basically will have a zero carbon footprint our electrical costs will be very stable because we're producing our own power. And uh, we, can, we can use CNG to back it up. And if we're successful with our hydrogen fields and there's excess hydrogen, we can use hydrogen to back up this facility as well if there's issues where you're not getting enough radiant uh, energy coming from the sun. What is really important about this plan is the flexibility. It can run a minimum 300,000 cubic feet a day to a maximum of 10.5 million cubic feet a day. And we believe that new helium discoveries will be smaller in nature. The big natural gas fields are in decline along with it. The helium production is also in decline and it's resulted in a critical shortage of helium for all the modern applications that we take for granted. Helium's used to uh, cool data centers, MRIs, it's used in rocket launches, it's used to create environments to develop products like fiber optics, it's used in every single liquid hard drive out there. And of course, the traditional uses lifting gas and leak detection, deep sea dry, diving, that type of stuff. But it's the new applications that are really driving the demand for it while the production is in decline because there's no new money going into the natural gas fields. So the industry is going to have to look for these unique opportunities like what we're in. And for us, having a small plant like this can be dropped basically anywhere in the world. This is a marine grade plant. Uh, that can be powered by a number of different energy sources. If you're in a natural gas field, you can power it with that. If you're in the desert, you can go to solar. And you can start out with a very small amount of throughput and add more wells to it and build the throughput up until you maximize it out. So this is the first solar powered helium processing facility that we're aware of that anybody in the world has built. This is what it looks like. The interior you can see is crammed full of valves and pipes and everything. None of the technology is really unique or new. This technology has been around for 70 years. It's, it's pressure, temperature swings, cryogenics, and membrane technology. And you basically take out all any kind of hydrocarbons or anything else on the front end of it. The last gas to be pulled out is nitrogen, uh, which is vented off. A majority of what we've got is, is nitrogen and it's environmentally benign. And then you isolate the helium, purify the helium and um, process it to requested grades by end users. It'll run anywhere from balloon grade helium, which is referred to as, as 4.9, 99.99% pure, all the way up to 6.9 and a 5 helium, uh, which is 99.99995 pure helium, and it's more like chip grade. So the grades are really vary depending on what the end user is requiring there. <clears throat> These are the wells that are going into production through the Macaulay Helium Processing Facility. And what we really can't uh, stress enough is how important raw gas composition is to your bottom line, because the fewer 
elements there are in that raw gas coming out of your wellhead under naturally occurring pressure, the easier it is to finally isolate and purify the helium. As you can see in our offset wells, five, six, and seven, it's 96.5% nitrogen, very trace CO2, well below EPA standards. In fact, that CO2 falls out when we dry the moisture out of the gas. All our, all our wells are dry holes, but you're always gonna have some moisture in there. So once you've gotten rid of the CO2 and the nitrogen, you really are purifying the helium down to end user grades. And as opposed to processing costs in say a natural gas field being about 140 to $160 in MCF, our costs are more like 18 to 20 in MCF. So we've got very good margins built into this. This is basically our project. Uh, I-40 runs down the middle of it. We've got uh, from Meteor Crater to the Rolfing Field is about 70 miles. The projects run down both sides of I-40, although a majority of it's on the south side, as you can see. The yellow blobs up in the right-hand corner are the Pintadome um, fields from the 1960s and 70s that we really modeled our geology on. And the reason that our maps look like uh, checkerboards is I referred earlier that we're looking more or less for high grade pots. And what we're drilling into are anticlinal features, which are created when you get um, crustal plate movements. And as the crustal plates move up, you end up with these structural highs, which are the anticlinal features. And we're drilling down anticlinal hinges and we are really staying to the structural highs. We have no interest in being in the synclines. You'll basically just find water down there, maybe a few hydrocarbons, but up in the structural highs, all the helium all rises and it needs to find a trap, otherwise it escapes the Earth's atmosphere. The helium itself is created by degradation of uranium-238 in association with cesium, thorium, lithium down deeper in the Earth's crust. And as that helium's created, as it moves up through the Earth's crust, unless it encounters a trap that holds it in, it just leaves the atmosphere back into the universe. It's interesting that hydrogen and helium make up 98% of the universe's ma um, matter, and both of them are rare on Earth because they both want to escape the atmosphere. They need to be trapped. And really, because the molecules are so small, they're very, very difficult to store because they'll almost pass through any type of uh, matter that we have. Uh, transportation's an issue. For us, we're within three hours of Phoenix, and Phoenix has 48 end users that we've identified that are all desperate for helium. So they're willing to drive up to this site with their own trucks and pick up the helium and take it back to Phoenix. Um, Taiwan Semiconductor is currently constructing a chip facility there. That facility uh, is a $40 billion investment for Taiwan Semiconductor. And that single facility will use more helium that's produced in all of Western US combined. These first two, or these two wells are the Rolfing field. And the reason that we're not putting them into production currently is the assorted minor gases down at the bottom there, our noble gases, argon, krypton, xenon, and neon, and they, they need a liquefaction unit. So the Rolfing plant will be very similar to the Macaulay plant, but it will have a liquefaction unit attached to it. And there are certain applications out there, companies like SpaceX want to buy liquefied helium. So, you know, we'll broaden out our um, end user base with another plant that can liquefy the helium. You can see how good the helium grades are in there, but we've got more CO2 and we've got the noble gases, which have value, but are more difficult to get out. I do have uh, one question here where, uh, where do we intend to place the second plant? It will be the Rolfing field. It will be to process these specific gases. And as we drill more wildcats, when we have two 
plants operating, depending on raw gas composition of new wells, we'll be able to decide which plant to send the gas to and process. This is the basically geological setting. This is that anticlinal hinge I was talking about. The photo on the bottom there is actually an anticline that's uh, visible at surface. A lot of the features that we're looking at are invisible. They're down maybe two, 300 feet. So it's a lot of on the ground geology with us. This area that we're in is silt and sandstone and it's got a twin rail line running through there with trains going by every five minutes. So seismic really doesn't work. We've had to go to other techniques in order to move forward with this. So in summary, uh, we are commencing production here shortly. We will be direct selling directly to end users. Our business model with the end user will be, you bring your truck to our plant, we will fill it up. When you wire 90% of the monies into our bank account, we'll open up the gate and let you out. And once you get it back to your facility and you're happy with the gas, send us the last 10% of the payment. So there won't be anything in the way of collectibles here. We're going to drill three hydrogen wells uh, this year, which is going to be looking at uh, commercializing the hydrogen in our fields. We'll be looking at drilling two more helium wildcats, hoping to have two more fields discovered. And by the end of the year, hoping to take delivery on the final processing facility. Um, and continue to obviously expand the team. Um, just taking a look here, please clarify the details of your first sale. We're gonna be selling everything at spot price. The shortage on helium is critical. Uh, the processing companies, which are Air Liquid, Matheson, Praxair, Air Products, those specialty gas companies have declared force majeure on the end user. So you're lucky to be getting 60% of your contracted deliveries. People out there right, are desperate for uh, helium. Uh, I expect we'll get the batteries for the Macaulay field by the end of April. But in the meantime, we're going to start it up and get it running on compressed natural gas. Um, why did we do this capital raise at this price and this amount? Uh, we've got a very ambitious capital expenditure program this year. When you start pre-ordering components for 13 to $15 million plants, we need to build infrastructure around the Macaulay field. For example, we need to buy a, a tractor and a couple of uh, tankers to haul the gas from wells number two and number eight up to the Macaulay field in order to process them. So we're continuing to build infrastructure around this. The money that we are raising will increase uh, the value of the stock. For example, we purchased two aiming units uh, last year for $450,000. We refurbished them uh, so that our total cost on the two were $450,000. We were offered a million five for one of those units. We're not selling it, we need it. but. It's the market that dictated the pricing on this. It is nothing I was happy about. Uh, I just want to get the financing closed. The status on legal proceedings is no, everything is not resolved. Um, we did win the uh, case in the appellant court. Um, Flagstaff continues to uh, bring up issues there. Uh, we're not really in full understanding of why there's no way we're going to impact that aquifer that they've got three miles from that well. This well is a simple vertical well, and we do everything um, environmentally that we can to protect the aquifers. We use food grade products downhole. We don't use drilling muds. We're not doing massive sand fracks, and uh, we're not really understanding the issue, but it continues along. What is the average time to fill a customer? I, I really can't answer that right now. It's going to depend on the flows coming out of the wells. And we're going to bring those wells on quite slowly. Um, 
we're waiting for the tanker to come up there and the first tanker is going to be filled with a a real selection of multiple gases. The end user is going to be using it, I think, for welding. He doesn't care if it's 495969. So when we get the plant up and running, we're obviously going to be playing with the plant to really get a full understanding of it. And I think we are now officially out of time.